this man's astonishing talent would be worth millions of dollars. If only he'd turned to crime. I crack safes for a living. That's right, he cracks safes for a living, about 500 a year, and he does it faster than anyone else. Unfortunately for his bank book, he's honest. His clients include the usual suspects, the FBI, the Secret Service, high-end jewelry stores, and all the major banks, as well as everyday screw-ups who forget their own combinations. I worked for a locksmith since I was 12 years old, and he had an old book on the arm, and I read it. Cracked my first safe when I was 15, and said, this is cool. He's the seven-time world champion of the Lockmasters International Manipulation Contest, which means he is the best of the best and the fastest of the fastest. The average time it takes me to open up a safe would probably be, um, I would say 15, 20 minutes. How does Jeff do it? To you and me, this safe is an impregnable fortress. To Jeff, it's like opening a can of soda. Is it all in the fingertips? Is Jeff Sitar more than human? To crack his secret, we brought him to our test chamber. First, we had him explain the basics. Here's an example of a cutaway, basically, of an inside of a safe. Can you show us how you would, how you would manipulate this to, to get it open? Well, what you do is there's gates in the wheel, these little cutouts, like the one right there. Yeah. You have to line them up underneath a part called the fence. You line up the first wheel, then the second wheel, and finally the third. Turn it right until the fence drops into the lock, retracts the lock bolt, and now you turn the handle of the safe and you're in. Got that? Basically, the locking mechanism is a set of wheels, and the trick is to line up notches on these wheels with contact points. When all the notches are lined up, the lock opens. I have a little test here for you. We wanted to see how sensitive his fingers really are. So we place tiny objects on a lock cylinder. Test your sense of sight. Let's Cut. see if he can spin the dial and stop on the number each object sits on. This is all open in the back, so I can see if you're right or not. Okay. And you're sure there's only one object? Yes. Yep, there's only one. You got it? That was, what number was that? 15, you're right on, the, right on the dot there. Jeff was able to stop on the number marked by a toothpick. Okay, not a big enough deal? Fine, now we'll get tough. You're feeling stress on that? Like a gear. Like a I'm gear. I'm feeling a little stress on the dial. You're absolutely right, <laughs> two for two. This spin doctor was able to feel the minute amount of force from a post-it filling in one of the notches in the tumbler. Now he's on the third dial, the toughest in our spin tests. Right there. Jeff, that's a feather. You were able to detect the small, lightweight feather in that scene. Watch again as Jeff fixates on the first dial, discerning the placement of a toothpick. Here he moves on to the second dial, twirls it carefully, and locates the exact whereabouts of a post-it. And finally, with otherworldly skill, he's able to sense the edge of a feather. The fact that he detected these minuscule traps was amazing. But what was truly remarkable was how fast he did it. So now it's time for our most challenging test. Security expert Tony Maniacci has delivered a brand new state-of-the-art gun safe to our test facility. We asked Jeff to take a stab at breaking into this baby. So all you have to do is shut it up and lock it. And lock it. it around and lock it. Spin the dial. And it doesn't matter which way. Doesn't matter which way. We've, we've scrambled everything completely. Okay. Let's do this. You know what? I'm going to time you. Is that all right? Got it? Jeff, my friend, world champion, start. We've placed a camera inside the safe, so as Jeff spins the wheel, you can watch the tumblers do his bidding. You got a number? Already. 
That was less than a minute into it. That where it belongs. You think you have another number? Mm -hmm. Or are you just trying to set the... I'm trying to drop that bar in it from like a half a number off. We'll still drop it if you rattle it like that. You having problems with this one a little bit? Not at all. No, Going great. For the last one. Going for the last number already. Oh, man. Jeff Sitar has opened this safe in four minutes and 57 seconds. It would have taken you hours to do this, Tony? Hours. Come on right over here, Jeff. This is just unbelievable. Jeff just opened a three-number combination safe. So how does he do it? And how does he do it so incredibly fast? Sure, he's developed his amazing skills through years of practice. Yes, he knows some tricks about how certain tumblers fall in a certain way. But what sets him apart from the rest of us? According to our scientific investigation, it's his phenomenal finger sensitivity. It's a, a passion of mine. It's a love of mine. I mean, I go into work going, yes, I'm working today. But uh, I, I don't know. I talent or gift, I really can't say that. Jeff Sitar, you know... Without a doubt, your sense of sight, hearing, and sense of feel, you're definitely more than human. Coming up next, we challenge our safe cracker to open the ultimate impenetrable bank safe. Can he do it? And how long will it take? We have one heck of a big safe here. The clock starts when we return. Jeff Sitar opens over 500 safes every year with just his bare hands. And it's those hands that have made him the world's best legal safe cracker. But most of the time, Jeff doesn't have the chance to get his hands on the kind of bank vaults that you can find at your local savings and loan. They're off limits, even to him, until now. In order to give Jeff the ultimate safe cracker test, we brought him to a bank in New Jersey to see if he can open this safe and how long it might take. And this vault is no pushover. It's a four-turn tumbler system that has over a hundred million possible combinations. Its precisely calibrated cogs and pins are made of special alloys that resist easy opening. Jeff, it's great seeing you again. You know, you impressed me so much in the studio, but you know, he could have been a friend of yours. It could have been, you know, somewhat of an easy safe. We picked our own bank this time. We have one heck of a big safe here. Do you think you're up to it? Give it a shot. Good luck. Start. And to keep him honest, though we already know he is, we'll run this break-in in real time. If you want to keep track of how Jeff is doing, you can watch him here. In the meantime, we'll continue our investigation of a guy who became a real accidental tourist on a trip to Niagara Falls when he fell over the top and survived. The water was rushing up. It was a beautiful day outside, yet I could see clearly through the falls um, in, in, a, in a blurred, magical, crystal-like pattern as I was falling, and, and it was oddly beautiful. And in my mind, I was wondering, is this what it's like to die? We know why Kirk Jones survived the initial fall, because the water is super aerated, which, in layman's terms, means it has very low density, so it's really soft. That is the good news, but it's also the bad news. Things that normally float, like oranges or people, don't. All I saw was a dark white foam, and I could not, uh, I did, and I did not know which way was up. And while Kirk was trying to swim at the bottom of that pool, there was also a second force at work against him. Tons of water from above hitting him at 70 miles per hour. There, there, there was a pressure there. It felt like a thousand hammers were beating me on the head. So we've prepared two tests that will recreate the forces at play at the bottom of the falls to determine exactly what Kirk had to overcome in order to live. The aerated water, which is nearly impossible to stay afloat in, and the thousands of gallons of water hitting him from above. So how lethal is the cascading water at the bottom of Niagara Falls? We are about to find out. 
So it's all set and ready to go, eh? Wow, this is it, huh? Each other and ready. This is our guy. Yeah, we're about to see what it, uh, what it looks like in real life. So explain again what we're going to do here, Jim. We're going to take this, this body, our, our replicant here, it's 150 pounds, tethered up to our scale at the top, and we're going to suspend them underneath the waterfall so we can, you know, get a real feel for what the impact forces are. Great. So, are we ready uh, to go? Let's you ready it. to see it? Yeah. We want to see it. it. Let's go ahead and fire up the pump, guys. Okay, John. Well, come around and hold them underneath. There you go. Uh, this is maximum flow right here. What? Maximum flow. Maximum okay. Flow. Is it hard to hold? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of pressure to it. Oh, I right couldn't right imagine there, you trying to breathe in this either. John and Jim are holding the replicant in the center of the rushing water. The replicant is attached to a scale that will show how much pressure is coming from above. So it looks like, looks like we're peaking out at about 250 pounds, which is 100 pounds over his weight. Oh, okay. This water is going 20 miles per hour. Remember, this is only 1 20th of the force that hit Kirk Jones as he struggled to get out of the grip of Niagara. Really, really tough to even hold it. And then it's like tug of war with Mother Nature here. You can feel how much. Yeah, how, I felt how much it when I held it. Was. Can you get it back up here? I need some sort of water soak now. Got it? It's all right. Ready? One, two, three. Got it? Four, <laughs> five, One, six. There we go. All right. Now we talked about how he got off some pretty minor injuries considering. What injuries would you normally expect to see with an accident like this? Well, the first thing you expect to see is death. Pretty much everyone who's gone over the falls without some kind of barrel or protective gear Practically, has, yeah. has died. Most right. have died. Yeah. So, so yeah. many things could, it, could kill you in this kind of I mean, Our scale was, you know, he's 150 pounds. We were mm -hmm. between 250 and 300. So imagine another, an additional 150 pounds on your back. You know, based on our, on our, on our small test that we did in the shop, uh, the only thing that was working for him on the fall, the impact, was the fact that the, the water is aerated. And if you recall, he may have had a more cushioned fall, but, uh, but you know, that was the only thing going for him on that side. Lucky, lucky fellow. So what are we going to do next, Jim? You know, the, the next test we want to simulate is, is a buoyancy test. And that, that will tell you what other elements he was working against, not only the impact forces of the waterfall coming down on him, but the fact that he was, you know, the aeration of the water makes you less buoyant. Okay. So we're going to bring our diver in and, and uh, demonstrate that. We're going to use a real that. person is what you're yes. saying. Yes. I think that's the best way okay. to do it. Okay. Okay. That's right. It's one thing to use a dummy. But we're about to put a real human being into this lethal cauldron of torrential falls from above and swirling water from below. So while we're setting up the second part of the Niagara Falls test, let's check in on the progress of the safe cracker. Jeff and his incredible hand have been working at opening this bank vault for just over five minutes. Remember, this is the real deal. The kind of safe you keep your money and your personal safety boxes in. Jeff just opened this bank safe in the record duration challenge time of 5 minutes and 19 seconds. Jeff Sitar has again proven that he is truly more than human.